a word about what she's going to be talking about because she is going to tell you what she's going to be talking about. There we go. So, <laughs> Zoe. Hi everyone, thank you so much for coming today and thanks to the um, group at the DCS for inviting me along as well. Oh, if there's not a click on, I'm going to have to... There you go. Um, just a short introduction about me, really. Actually, about half the people in the room already know me, so probably just introducing myself to the other half. Um, a bit about my background, I am an IT support engineer at Instant IT. Um, I am also doing a Masters in Information Security at Royal Holloway, part-time. Um, and I've had about five years in the industry. Blockchain is... Um, you know I'm one of the PhD examiners at Holloway, don't you? Oh, God. <laughs> now I do. <laughs> oh, so, sorry, we're, we're going to be interrupting you like crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yes, and please do. If you have any questions throughout the talk, like, just say something. Okay, just a, a small bit about Instant IT. So we're based in central London. We've been in business 14 years. We've got mainly clients in London, so I am one of the lucky people that gets to go and see our clients, and we specialise in infrastructure consultancy, um, IT support, project management, and security. So, just about what we'll go through today. Um, the talk is about the cryptography behind cryptocurrencies. I will be doing some talking about cryptography, so I'll try not to bore you for the beginning bit. I don't want you to think of it like a, a lecture or anything like that. Um, the second half of the talk is going to be a bit more of a discussion. I want us to have a two-way thing, talk about blockchain, talk about what's going on, um, and especially I'm very interested to know how you think it would affect your industries. I know we have lots of people from different industries in here, um, so let's have a discussion about it. So, intro, um, the intro to security services and cryptography. <laughs> I, I got that one right, right through the middle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was also going to say my sister illustrated this uh, presentation, so um, I've cited her at the end. But yes. <laughs> okay. So, if we're talking about security services, um, you've probably heard these terms thrown around everywhere. You've got confidentiality, so it means that. Um, data cannot be viewed by an authorised party, and sometimes people refer to it as secrecy. Um, data integrity, so the data cannot be altered in transit. You've got data origin authentication. Think of this kind of like computers understanding exactly where the data has come from. Maybe like if you're sending an email, and it definitely wants to know that it's come from that specific email server. And non-repudiation. So this term is it's a bit questionable because cryptography, as we all learn, does provide non-repudiation, but a uh, lots of factors surrounding it, it may not mean that you can actually hold it in a court of law. You've definitely done it. In terms of the cryptographic primitives that allow us to have these types of um, security services. Now this could apply to data, whether data is in transit, whether data is um, just stored on a device. Uh, I wanted to cover all of the cryptographic primitives, well, the majority of them, so that we'd have a good idea of the um, different things going on. Not all of these do apply to Bitcoin, I'll tell you right now. So actually, if we look at confidentiality, we apply encryption to our data. Uh, we use encryption to make sure that it's confidential. But just because it's encrypted doesn't mean that it can't be changed along the way when you're sending it across the channel. So that's where data integrity comes in. So you want to have, and just to also let you know, I have simplified this down a bit. A hash function actually only provides quite a weak notion of data integrity. I put it in here because it applies to Bitcoin. So I, I can talk more about that. Um, so yes, a hash function, we'll go into what that does in a second. The message authentication code and Mac. So you've probably seen these. You usually have um, encryption and a Mac because you'd want to encrypt your data and also make sure it's not being changed in transit. And a digital signature. This is very important for us to, to understand because hash functions and digital signatures are what mean that cryptocurrencies and blockchain work. So that's the overview. I want to go into a little bit more detail about it. So, you've probably seen these types of diagrams before. You've got the key there, encrypts, same key decrypts, and you, you see how it goes. But the way I like to think about it is, I don't know about you, my front door has two locks on it. It has a yellow lock on the top, 
that just snaps shut when I close it. And it has a deadlock on the bottom, like a mortise lock, that I literally have to turn it to lock it and turn it to unlock it. So if we think about symmetric encryption, we're thinking about our mortise lock at the bottom. When I close the door, it's still open until I literally close it with my key. That exact same key has to then be used to open it, which is great. Um, so this is what I was trying to say there. Um, <laughs> just a bit arty, not kind of functional, but you know. Um, I have popped this in the bottom here, mainly because I know there are some techies in the audience, not naming anybody, um, and who maybe like or do not like binary. And I just wanted to show really what is a symmetric key doing at its very heart. So I put my name and binary here, and then I just tapped really randomly on the keyboard to get myself a random key, although it's probably not that random. Um, and then what you do is you, you basically add these two lines together to get our encrypted text. Now, again, please switch off if you're not a fan of binary, but the XOR table here, just to remind us how it XORs. Exclusive or. <laughs> exactly, exclusive or. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the thing that I love about this function, and maybe just because I'm a massive maths geek, I forgot to mention I took a bachelor's degree in maths, um, is that you can XOR this, the exclusive or, the encrypted text with the key again, and we get out the plain text. And that's just fantastic. I just, I love it so much. So I had to put that in there. <laughs> so now let's think of public key encryption. Now, I know we've got our two locks on the door. We've explained how our mortise lock um, works. Let's think about our top lock. Now, your friend's staying with you overnight, and you're like, I've got to go to work, but you can stay in my house. Just shut the door on your way out and it will lock. So they, anybody can be in your house, come out of it, shut the door and it locks. But only you can get back into it with your key. And that works the same if the analogy is with a Yale lock, an unopened Yale lock, you hand it to somebody, they close it and you hand it back and you're the only person with the key. So this is how it works. So the receiver, so remember it's on the receiver side, they create a private and a public key. And when you encrypt your data, the sender encrypts it with the receiver's public key, and only the receiver can decrypt it with their private key. Um, a quite a good real-world example of this is when we log into our online banking, and when you're using a HTTPS website, it is in, you know, secured with SSL TLS, which uses public key cryptography to ensure that your data is encrypted with the, hello, come in. Stop don't, don't be shy. Yeah. No, <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so if you're logging into your online banking, and another thing, just the more advanced um, aspects of public key cryptography, which hopefully some of you will enjoy. Um, how is this possible? Well, it's possible with what we call one-way functions, things that are very easy for computers. We, we always think about computers doing everything easily. Oh, it can you know, work this out, it can work that out. But we don't realize about how much time it takes things to, to happen. So let's think about integer factorization, for example. You're taking two very large primes and timesing them together. And just like we did with the, the XOR, timesing them together is very, very easy. But finding which two primes, oh, you're such a gentleman. <laughs> Um, finding out which two primes are then, more, you know, from the, the big number, that is incredibly hard for a computer to do. And that is what RSA is based on, if you've heard of RSA. So it's, that's based on integer factorization. Another one is the discrete logarithm problem, which is what Elgamal is based on. I won't go too much into that. If you want any more information about this, please come to me afterwards. I have whole textbooks I could give you about this. Very, very exciting stuff. Um, <laughs> and the final one, uh, our one-way function is elliptic curve. Now, I, I had to pop that in there because uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies use elliptic curve digital signature algorithms. So that's the reason for using this in the aspect of blockchain and the aspect of cryptocurrencies is because the elliptic curve uses much shorter keys, much less data we're storing there when we're storing keys. So I had to put this bit in there because, again, I'm a bit of a geek and I absolutely love this stuff. Um, <laughs> so randomness, um, again, not got a huge thing on, on cryptocurrencies, but I just love it. You know, what is randomness? And I don't think people realize sometimes, oh, you can just get randomness. Well, not exactly. I'll, I'll list off some of the things that are true <laughs> randomness. So we've got rolling a dice, that's truly random. A roulette wheel, a fairly balanced one, that is, is really random. Radioactive decay, atmospheric noise, 
and in and in um, in, in Silicon Valley, Cloudflare, they have an entire wall made out of lava lamps. No joke. And they film it, and they put that through a hash algorithm, and that gives them their randomness. Because you cannot predict lava lamps, you cannot predict radioactive decay. But in reality, um, you computers will use some bit of randomness and then turn that into pseudo-randomness. So, you know. so a, a good example of this is the return of the Coppersmith attack. Again, if you want more information, just hit me up afterwards. I'll link you to it. But what was quite interesting about this one was that the pseudo-random number generator in Infineon's chip in the trusted platform module was not so random after all, and the attackers started to find a pattern with the random numbers that it was generating. So the scale of this attack was ridiculous. It was, um, you know, Microsoft products, Google Chrome, UV keys, and 750,000 of Estonia's national ID cards had to be reissued. Because all because when the random number was generated in Finian's um, trusted platform module, it was not so random. That is how important randomness is in our in our security. And um, yeah, so that was that was a big fail. Actually, it was really sad for the cryptographic community when that happened because YubiKeys is meant to be the most secure thing, and then suddenly that's hit with something silly like this. But you know. Right, so again, this looks a little bit like a lecture, so don't get freaked out, we'll go into the fun stuff a bit later, but hash functions. <laughs> Not that this isn't very fun, I'm having a great time. Um, <laughs> so hash functions, all we need to know about hash functions is what they provide us. They're a one-way function, um, so and it condenses one inputs into a fixed output. It's very easy to compute, and every input should have a unique hash output, Obviously, if you if you think outside the box, you know that with putting any amount yeah. of um, letters in any order in, you know, the probability is you are going to get collisions. But just to put it into perspective, our SHA-256 hash algorithm has never had a collision because our best hash algorithms have never had reported um, collisions. So you can basically say it's almost unique. So hello. Hello, BCS. Hi. Hello, BCS. And then the entire work of War and Peace, you can see their hash algorithms here. They look pretty random, all the same length. It doesn't really matter what you put in there. <clears throat> right, digital signatures. When I was doing this diagram, I was doing it in my head, and at the end it doesn't look so slick, but hopefully you'll follow me. So <coughs> we have our sender here, and we're going to use our trusty hash algorithm to, to hash. So the scenario I want to think of here is, say I've created a will, and I want to send it to my lawyer. And my lawyer needs to know that it's definitely come from me. Nobody, none of my, you know, children have tried to submit the will on my behalf. That's a really weird, weird scenario. So, so basically what you're saying is when the receiver looks at the hash, he, he knows that there's been no change in the data. Absolutely. And then he decrypts it after that. Absolutely. Well, I'll show you what's actually, in this scenario, we're not even encrypting the data we want to sign. We have got a contract, which is plain text, we hash it, we then encrypt the hash. Because what we're Are doing there. The hash? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay. Because if you encrypted the actual plain text and they decrypt it with your public key, how would they know it's definitely correct? Wow. You know, because they, you know, people could change it on the way. So what I mean, like I said, in in normal scenarios, this is used with a whole other bunch of cryptographic primitives like encryption, so like that to make sure that it's encrypted. But in this scenario, we have a plain text um, document. We hash it. We encrypt the hash with our private key. We then send our private key along with the document to our lawyer. The lawyer then hashes our document. It, he decrypts our hash and then matches them. And basically says, so that means that as you're going on the channel, there has been literally no change to the data at all because either of these ones wouldn't work. Sorry, I kind of did that a bit backwards. What I was meant to say at the beginning was digital signatures are public key encryption, but in reverse. I missed that whole bit out. Um, yeah, so like I said, when we were going through public key encryption but before, the we were. The thing is, I mean, I mean for, for this to work, I've got to know what your private key is. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because you've shared it with me, mm. but you shared it with me down the pub. Mm. I know. <laughs> and, you know, and, and in real, you know, when we're taught it, it's, you know, non repudiation is provided by digital signatures. But if you really go to a court of law, someone would just say, well, someone took my private key. Yes. Well, I was compromised. Well, you know, so actually, in reality, um, you can't do this in real life 
well, necessarily in real life scenarios, but it works incredibly well. Thing, 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 thing that, you know, I'm, I'm, you, you don't, you, you must separate your, uh, your keys mm. from the um, from from the stuff that you're sending. It can't be in the same send, in other words. Mm, exactly, mm. exactly. So you know the fact that you know and you can send me a message, great, but you've got to give me the key in the pub the night before. How do you do that? Mm. How do you give the person the key and the data without it being collected by somebody else? You know what? I've, I've probably just not explained it properly. So what we're going to do as a person is I'm going to create a public and private key pair. So my private one's my signature and I keep this to myself. I don't share it with anybody at all. My verification key is something that I distribute widely. Or, you know, I send it to, actually in protocols, you send it to the person and say, here's my verification key, just so that you know that it's me. Um, That's only done once, right? Yes. The verification is given to a club member once. You join a club, I send you the verification key when you sign up to whatever, right? It's more a case that... I'm providing you with data and I want you to know it's definitely come from me. Sure. So you know my verification key and only I, um, this is on the basis that only I know my own signature key. So I send you my membership mm -hmm. and I hash it and I encrypt it with my private key and I send it over to you. Okay. And you have my public key because I'm my public key is on registry or you know it's widely known that's my public key and you receive the document. You're able to hash this, decrypt this, match them off and say this definitely came from Zoe McKenzie. Because I know okay. Zoe Zoe okay. is the only person that had okay. that signature key. So that's where the, the, the complete okay. non repudiation comes from. Okay. Exactly, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so now we've Congratulations, everyone. We've got on over the lecture. <laughs> We're now going to get on to actually what the talk is about. Um, so, where it all began, Bitcoin. And this was meant to be people jumping and swimming in a sea of coins. Um. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> so, uh, so uh, slightly just before we go on, and, and this is a really rough outline. I don't. I do have to admit, I don't know much about real world swift transfers. I've you know, receive this information off the interweb. Um, but in general, this is how our banking system will transfer international payments. So let's say I live over here in North America and I'm sending to my friend in Australia. Um, imagine a world, you've got all the banks in the world, you've literally got thousands, hundreds of thousands of banks in the world. Not every single bank trusts every other single bank in the world. It's just not possible. Especially not the Nigerians. <laughs> <laughs> just sometimes you might sometimes you might get a really small bank in the back end of nowhere, and you know it has very. So the point is that that's where Swift comes in. Swift is a network of banks and says, "Look, we will take care of the trust relationships for you. You just tell us where you want it to go, and we will manage the trust relationship between each bank. So your payment kind of hops banks as it goes. Um, at each stage, you incur a small transaction fee. I'm showing here." Um, and also, if you're crossing currencies, this might result in a quite, you know, a not a great, you know, what's it called? Exchange rate, that's it. Um, yeah, so, so and, and sometimes it can take up to five working days. I haven't transferred an international payment recently, so I don't know. Um, but this is, this is kind of how we're going with it. Uh, and also, another thing to note is, if you imagine, I don't know if anyone's done any kind of just basic bookkeeping, probably all in this room, but when you have money coming in, money going out, you've got to reconcile your ledger at that point. You've got to say, okay, I'm, I'm debited or accredited this money and I'm debiting it out. And so every single bank has their own set of records that they need to keep up to scratch. Um, so actually, it's quite a complicated system if you think about money going around the world. That's just a bit of backstory. Another thing, and this is again not something that I'm, uh, you know, have researched into widely. I've just merely put two events that have happened on the same page. I'm not saying that there's a correlation or anything. But the Bitcoin paper, um, the peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash paper, was published in 2008. The actual system got set up in 2009, um, and also, of course, we all remember the financial crash and the following recession of 2008. So, whether this was planned or not in terms of the paper being released, but I think that there was some kind of need in the community for people who wanted to set up a decentralized payment network. And when this paper came out, they were like, let's do it. So, 
Now let's get into the, the nitty gritty of it. So what we've also got to visualize here, because after all, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, they are a network. They are a network of computers, servers, um, all different kinds of nodes in the world. So over here is our normal standard setup, incredibly simple, looks like my home. Probably I've got more devices at home, which is a bit scary. Um, but yeah, so this is our client server network. It works very, very well for what we're using it for at the moment. You know, the, the server here hosts our application. We keep that up to date, we keep that patched, and then the clients connect into it and they have all the functionality of that server. Um, however, if we think about a distributed network, on the right hand side here, um, we're thinking about computers. There is no central server here. All the computers are connected up with each other. And the main thing to point out is that every single computer node on the network is equal. Whether you are a computer or a human operating it, it is equal. Mm. Um, and in terms of the Bitcoin network, these nodes, not all the nodes are miners. I know if you guys know, know about a bit more about Bitcoin, which I'll go into, kind of doing this a bit backwards. Um, some of these nodes might be full miners, i.e. they're mining the blockchain, they're holding a whole load of the Bitcoin um, holding a wallet on there, whereas some of these computers might just be your dad wanted to invest in some Bitcoin, so he downloaded a Bitcoin wallet software onto his computer and is now connected into the network. So everybody is connected to each other and all the equal. Okay, so, and just to let you know, this isn't a, a lesson on how to buy Bitcoin. Um, I did have some people ask me that. I've actually personally never bought any cryptocurrencies, so I'm probably not a great person to ask of how you logistically do it. But mathematically, I can tell you what to do, um, <laughs> which is the fun part, obviously. Um, so first of all, creating a wallet. So you probably heard of wallet software, um, you download that onto a computer. That's the, that's the main way that people do it. And what does your wallet software do at this point? Well. It creates you, exactly like when we're talking about digital signatures, with a signature key and a verification key. Now this wallet software is secure, you would hope it's secure, on your computer, and only you have access to this signature key here. So then, when you want to send or receive Bitcoin, what do you do? Well, your wallet software does it all for you, but it basically converts your verification key, your public key, that anyone can know, um, it kind of hashes it a bit, it base 58 codes the result, and this is what a Bitcoin address looks like. So, yeah, and some people create vanity addresses. Don't know why you want to do that, because it's not exactly anonymous if you do that, but they basically just run through all the different, you know, signature and verification key they can, so that when it actually goes through this, it says, like, one Steve Rocks. Ah, uh, not that you would do that. But that's quite interesting. Um, so is there any downside to giving your Bitcoin address out? Because if it's coming from your public key that's then been hashed, if it's coming from your private key, there's no way of backwards engineering that to find your private key. Um, no, 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 absolutely not. So the so just assume because of the digital signature algorithm that if somebody has your public key, they will never be able to get your private key. And I really touch wood because of everything that happens around it. It's very devastating. Um, but the theory is, if if all goes well, you know, they will never be able to reverse engineer this. This is totally secret for you. Um, but in terms of them finding well, this out, so this is the other thing. You put it up on the bloody screen. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not a secret. You put it up on the screen. Well, I know, and also, by the way, this is not a real Bitcoin address, so I'm not asking for donations. Sometimes people do these things and they say, oh, if you want to you send me some Bitcoin. No, don't, it's random. Um, yeah, so just a scenario here. So we've created our Bitcoin wallet, this is our address, um, and I want to use my Bitcoin to pay my membership fees to the BCS. Um, so how do I do that? Well, the BCS membership fee is 10 Bitcoin, a bit steep, but you know, it works for this purpose. So I'm going to transfer 10 Bitcoin and I'm going to send it to their public address, okay? Now this entire, think of this like a promise of payment. I'm promising to pay you 10 Bitcoin. So this is a statement, just like our plain text, and I'm then going to sign, remember like we did before with the digital signatures, I'm going to sign the statement with my signature that I could have only done if I have my private key. So on the assumption that you own your wallet, you can sign that. Okay, <coughs> sorry if this looks a bit busy. Um, I'll hopefully just look at the top line for me at the moment. So if we're thinking about Bitcoin transactions um, chains, how does the Bitcoin network know um, that you have enough money in your account to spend in Bitcoin? But what it, it doesn't hold balances, that's the biggest thing. It does not hold balances, it links transactions. It says, okay, if you have had 10 Bitcoin sent to you, 
you can then send that Bitcoin to somebody else. It's kind of like a transfer of ownership, but the, the network does not hold balances. It's incredibly simple. It's just a ledger. So what happens? Your friend is very generous and they, they transfer you 10 Bitcoin in transaction one. You then in turn use that 10 Bitcoin and you say, I'm going to transfer 10 Bitcoin to the BCS for my membership fee. So what is the system doing? The system says, okay, it's signed by your private signature key. And in this transaction, you'll link your previous transaction. And then it verifies that you were the recipient of 10 Bitcoin previously. Okay, stay with me. This is a, this is a little bit of a simple version. So it just goes on like that. So that's, it. again, you're thinking about transferring ownership, not actually owning anything, I guess, or well, yes, but you know, you're transferring it from one person to another. That's what you're doing. Um, now, just a little bit more in depth. Again, if you're finding the top bit a bit lost, then just zone out for like two minutes. Then I'll tell you when to wake up. Um, but if you want to know a bit more about how it's actually going on, the Bitcoin network actually takes a number of inputs and a number of outputs. All of these have to balance to zero. So in this scenario, imagine the BCS had decreased my membership fee by five Bitcoin. And I'm like, oh, that's very generous of you. So my friend still transferred me 10. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to input the transaction one. I'm going to say, look, I can prove I have 10 Bitcoin because my friend transferred me 10 Bitcoin and I've not spent it here. And then I'm going to say, OK, and I want to spend five of that Bitcoin back to BCS. But then what do you do with the other five? Because the network isn't, remember, it doesn't keep track of balances. It's not going to sift through loads and loads of transactions to find out that you owed five Bitcoin. No, you're going to pay five Bitcoin back to yourself. And then if you want to spend this in the future, you just reference this one. So uh, the only way I can describe this is kind of like, has anyone been guilty of sending an email to themselves, like to transfer a document to themselves, even though you're meant to like upload it somewhere and download it? I'll just send an email to myself. That's basically what this is. It's just sending it back to yourself. So um, just to touch really quickly upon the double spending problem, this was already around before Bitcoin. You know, this is since the 70s or even before that. But you know, people digital public key encryption has been around. People know of the uh, you know ability to promise payment to one another. But the biggest problem that's been around is how do I know? that if you're paying me some money that you haven't already promised that money to somebody else. Or especially if you haven't already paid that money back to yourself and then it won't be valid for me. And that was, of course, you can do it if you have a trusted third party organizing this. So yes, you can do this already without Bitcoin, without decentralization, if you have a centralized server just to keep track of like where the transactions are. But that's not the point of Bitcoin. The point of Bitcoin is that it's decentralized. So I'll show you in a second how the double spending problem is resolved. So let's go back to our network here. We've got our network. Every single one of these nodes has a full copy of all of the transactions that's gone on in the network. So they can say, Zoe's already spent this Bitcoin or Zoe has not already spent this Bitcoin. But what they need to do between them, and bear in mind, they are all don't trust each other. Like nobody trusts each other. <coughs> not friends. So how do people or nodes who don't trust each other come to consensus? That's been one of like the biggest problems, uh, or the biggest theoretical problems for ages, and that's what was resolved by the Bitcoin paper that was published in 2008. So let's say I have this <coughs> computer here, I send in my transaction. My transaction then gets broadcast to a network, because remember, we're in a network scenario here. There are no routers, there are no subnets. This is one whole network. It just gets broadcast all over the place. And every single one of these nodes collects these transactions and they put them in an unspent transaction pool and they say, okay, we can agree. All these transactions are floating about with nowhere to go. We need to all agree which order they're going to be put into the ledger. And just to make sure that they've not already been spent. Okay, so this is where miners come in. So if you've heard of the term miners before, then that's fine. But essentially what miners are doing is they have to, I don't know how to explain it, they have to all arrive at consensus over something. So what can they do to do that? And uh, it's something called the proof of work mining puzzle. So if we cast our heads back to our hash function, remember how hard it was, well, how easy it was to compute a hash function. Very, very easy. You just put it into the function, it spews out a random hash, and that's absolutely fine. But imagine how hard it would be if I told you, you have to find a hash which looks normally very random, that starts with six zeros. 
by just taking your plain text and just incrementing or putting on a, a number at the end of it. And you have to find the number that's the right number that means that the hash looks like six zeros. Well, what you would probably say is, Zoe, yes, I could, but it would take me literally a million years, probably longer, way longer for a human to do that. Um, for computers, however, though, they just literally count through it. They just go through the hash, they increment the nonce, over and over and over and over and over again until they find this and boom, they've won. They've found the puzzle. They've done it. So what are they hashing in, and why is it so important for them all to come to consensus? So what you do is you have all of your transactions here and also there's a Coinbase transaction at the bottom which is 12 and a half Bitcoin at the moment. This goes to the miner who mines the block. So they're doing it for money. I don't know how much 12 and a half Bitcoin is worth at the moment. Quite a lot, probably. Um, so they're not doing this for nothing. Their, their incentive is money. Their incentive is profit to be able to solve this. So they have all the transactions here, and they have to verify that these transactions have not been spent before. Then what they do is they take a hash from a previous block, which I'll show you in a second, and they take the nonce, and they increment that nonce and over and over again until they find it. And when a miner finds this hash, it then broadcasts the whole, whole network I found this hash, it works, it's fine. And then they will verify it. And if they think that it's right, they will then say, okay, that's fine. That's where that's the state of the ledger. I'm going to put this in my system now. And then they just move on with more transactions. Sorry, this looks really complicated. It's not that complicated. I wanted to <coughs> oh, how do I go back? So I wanted to uh, show a little bit more advanced cryptography for anybody who wanted to know it, because I again I find it really interesting and Probably a lot of people don't, but I put the slide in there anyway. Um, what I wanted to show you was how the transactions are hashed together within the block. So it looks like this. It's something called a Merkle tree. So we have our transactions along the bottom, and I coloured them because I think colours are quite a good analogy for what this hash function is doing. So what you do is you hash every single transaction on its own, and then you hash pairs of transactions together, and then you hash those pairs, and again the colours are mixing. Every time you go up, the colours are mixing, and then you hash these two together to get this weird grey brown colour at the top. And this root hash is what is then put in the block header. Now, why is this significant? Well, it's more significant, again, if your dad's decided to buy Bitcoin and downloads a a uh, client onto his computer and he wants to verify a transaction. Well, if you verify a transaction in a block, you're gonna have to download that whole block all the transactions, hash them all together just to make sure that transaction was even part of it. But when you use Merkle trees, you only have to download a certain portion. I'll show you. Imagine we, we want to verify a transaction falls in the block. So instead of downloading everything, we just download these bits of the tree. We just download this so we can mix these together. Imagine the colors. We only have to download pink, orange, and this weird greeny blue thing. Um, to make to mix them <coughs> together, so we could literally just make that root hash color out of these colors. We didn't need everything else, so that is a real benefit for lightweight nodes in the Bitcoin system. And Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies use the same method of hashing their transactions because it is so. It just yeah makes it so much easier. Okay, so the blockchain. So at this point, we're now looking at how everything is linked together. So I I referenced this earlier one block and I did put the previous hash in there. But what's happening now is you can literally see it. So the header of one block then goes into the next block. And imagine the whole thing is hashed together. It makes a hash with a lovely, neat you know, 15 zeros at the beginning. And then it's like solidified in the, uh, the blockchain. And the reason why this is so important is because nobody can now go back and change anything in any of these blocks without not only affecting the root hash of this block, but because this is linked to the next block, the whole thing falls apart. The whole thing, you, you, yeah, you cannot write back. It is completely immutable. Um, it's write only. So if you look at this diagram here, again, in terms of consensus, this is how the nodes see each block. And imagine it's like a ledger, but just connected to each other and in blocks like this. So nodes will always take the longest line of blocks. Well, I won't go too much more into that, but um, come and speak to me afterwards if you want a bit more. So how sure. do all the nodes come to a consensus on what is the correct <coughs> So they always take the longest chain. Okay, so imagine the scenario. 
I am a node and I am building my next block with the hash from a pre this guy, the previous block here. Because I've received this chain, I'm like, okay, I'm going to build, I'm going to take a bunch of transactions, I'm going to build my block, I'm going to hash it based on inputting this hash in here. And then suddenly, the node next to me just transfers me the most up-to-date version of the blockchain, which happens to be like four, four blocks ahead. And suddenly I'm like, oh, dude, I've been working on an old block. And then so I have to discard it. Because it just discard everything I've had on everything I've been working on and just take the latest version of the, of the train. It's all about keeping up to date. Um, so if you could find a way to, to verify transactions yourself quicker than anyone else, mm -hmm. could you build a longer blockchain and then send it to all the other nodes? Yeah, yeah, but you'd have to keep it up. So that's what's called the 51% well, attack. You don't, you don't, yeah. if, it, if, they, if, any, if everyone takes the longest, you'd only have to get one block ahead for everyone to think of that. But then, but then is there a, a transaction that doesn't verify in your chain? Because the only because the only reason you would the only reason why you want to build along your own chain yeah. is if you have put um, invalid transactions in there. You yeah. know you've like double spent a couple yeah. of times. So what happens when blocks what happens when a block receives a blockchain? Will they actually quickly verify everything in so there? They still, they still look at the ledger too. They would, so let's say if they um, you would have to let it's called the fifty one percent attack. If you owned over half of all of the nodes. And you were able to, you know, basically compute a longer chain. Manipulate. Well, you were able to double spend, and you were able to like compute a longer chain. You would have to keep that up basically forever, because as long as there are honest nodes in the network, they will at some point mine a block. They will at some point realize, or see, you know, well, basically they could never mine on top of your block if your block's transactions are invalid. And that's one of the interesting things about it. To be fair, uh, Bitcoin is the incentive for miners. The computing power you would need to actually keep up the entire blockchain with invalid transactions is not worth what you would get by just mining blocks. It's, so, so the. the should I plug it in? Oh, okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, so, so that's what's really important about it is that you know you can have loads of really malicious people or malicious nodes on the blockchain, but as long as pretty much a third to a half are nice and they're they're working not nice but like nice. Not, not malicious um honest that's what i was looking for um then you'll get it will get caught out at some point um basically the way it was designed was it is more profitable to be honest in the system than it is to be malicious and there have been other attacks on it don't get me wrong but the theory behind it is yeah so oh yeah just to just to summarize what it is because we'll come back to this later so it's a pen only it's immutable so it's essentially tamper proof but um, There's no such thing as immutable. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. Because again, all of the Bitcoin network get compromised. But you know, it, it's, it's said to be immutable. Um, all nodes come to a consensus, and it's, it's basically transfers and records of ownership. You're transferring ownership from Bitcoin from one to another using digital signatures. Okay, so I put this bit in the, here again because I found some of these things heartbreaking. Really heartbreaking. Um, so key management, we've spoken about what, what is it that means that you own your Bitcoin? Like, if anyone can tell me what is it that it means that you can own your Bitcoin, then speak now. Private key? Private key? Delay everyone back. I used to do identity, but of course that was rubbish as well. It is rubbish because you could literally be a computer that has a private key. It is your private key. Your private key is what is your Bitcoin. If you can go onto the network with a copy of someone's private key, you can just claim everything that's been sent to them. As, like I said, as, you can be anyone, a, a bot, a human, a computer, whatever. As long as you have that private key, you can you own someone's Bitcoin. So what happens in terms of human, and unfortunately, I don't think some people realize this when they were investing in it. So, I mean, so yeah, crypto trader gets forced to hand over Bitcoin at gunpoint because imagine you've got your Bitcoin wallet on your phone and you're out there, you're boasting, how much Bitcoin do I have at the pub? People are overhearing you. Um, you're going to get probably mugged when you get outside of the pub if they have any sense in them, no offense. But like, you know, because they will just, just, you know, knife, unlock your phone and transfer me that Bitcoin now because there is no security around it. If we think about our, if we think about our banking, um, you know, that's the one thing I do think is, is awesome, is that 
um, you know, they have fraud detection teams just like working 24/7 just to make sure that your credit card's not being used, and they will block transactions in your account if you just suddenly like spend 600 pounds on one go, and you don't usually spend 600 pounds. Zoe spent six hundred pounds in Mauritius. That's definitely not me. They would just block that straight yeah. away. So they use statistics that your normal spend is this average. Exactly. And if it goes outside that, you know, that uh, yeah. tolerance, then they stop it and check it. Yeah. So much security around it, and I'm sure we've all had a moment where we've had the bank fraud team calling us up, going, "Have you been to Texas recently?" Absolutely not. Been staying in a motel in Texas, and they're like, "Oh, that's good because we blocked the transaction." I'm like, "Okay, great." But this does not happen with Bitcoin. There is no <coughs> around cryptocurrencies. There's no security like this. If someone forces you to transfer it over, that is that is um, you can't you know you might be able to arrest the thieves, but you won't ever be able to get that Bitcoin back. Um, so this guy, I just heart goes out to him. He was clearly told in the Bitcoin hype, use a hardware wallet, use a hardware wallet. So he thought, okay, I'm going to be vigilant. I'm not going to use a software wallet online. I'm going to, going to buy a hardware wallet from eBay. And he did. <laughs> and you now what he did, he bought this hardware wallet from eBay and he connects it to his computer, la la la, trans you know, transferred his life savings, you know, bought these Bitcoin on this thing. And the person who sold him the wallet had just taken a copy of his private key. Just because... Because I think people don't didn't understand, you know, that actually when you when you get the hardware wallet, change the keys. Yeah. Because key management, this is your money. You know, this is your money, and so this is yeah, it's heartbreaking really. But um, yeah, then this guy I actually don't feel that bad for because he's now saying he wants to dig up a dump site to find his hard drive or something like that. But he's getting lots of press from it anyway. He's doing that. But he yeah yeah he he threw his hard drive away and he did not take a copy of his key. And that's it. Your Bitcoin is gone. It's lost forever. So just to just to summarise on, on the Bitcoin standpoint, there have been a few issues with Bitcoin that have been raised. Um, this is not. I think this statistic up here. I will say that it costs a lot in energy bills, in electricity bills, to run mining centres. It really does. And where is the electricity cheap? Let's just say that. That's where people go. But the problem is, is that if you have a whole mining capability in a certain country, what if those get seized? What if you, you know, I mean, it, it, the integrity of the system is completely lost. Um, and transaction speed and volume. <coughs> I mean, you know how we were talking about transactions going into blocks because of double spends. Well, really, to make sure that it's definitely in the blockchain and you're not in a, a in a shorter chain, you probably want to wait like up to an hour, like maybe after six blocks have been mined for it to actually so you can't really pay for bitcoin when you're in a restaurant imagine you sit down what do you want i'm going to give you a bill now tap bitcoin and they have to wait an hour and then it kind of goes through so it's it's not practical and i don't think that when they it was created it was created more as a theory as opposed to actually a practical system that people can use um so yeah because like visa processes that compared to tr seven transactions per second environmental cost so we're looking at an environmental cost of you know a country larger than New Zealand and Hungary and just behind Peru when it comes to energy bills. So, yeah, I mean, environmentalists are going absolutely mental over it. It's Because imagine, we've got our, we've got our <coughs> network, and it's not a client-server network. We've got a few servers on clients. Every single device I have is basically a server. It is running like a server, so you can see how much energy I get. It's completely bulky. Um, and, yeah, and, like, a small number of people who own a high proportion of Bitcoin. The, the Vinkel boss... The Vinkelvoss, Vinkelvoss twins own quite a lot of Bitcoin, like 180 millions worth or something like that. Um, and of course, Satoshi Nakamoto, who made the system, owns apparently 6.1 billion worth. And another another fun 6.1 billion worth. Billions, of, billions, yeah. billions, billions, billions. Yeah, yeah. Well, bi billion dollars worth of Bitcoin. Yes. But the thing is, everyone's saying, who's Satoshi Nakamoto? Because he's uh, or she or a group of people are yeah. anonymous. Um, if anybody ever wanted to prove that they were Satoshi, they would just have to send a transaction from that account. So there is a way of validating it, and we haven't found Satoshi yet. Okay, so we'll go on to Blockchain 2.0. It is actually coined Blockchain 2.0. It's not just me trying to be snazzy. Um, smart contracts. So you've probably heard about them. Right, so what is a smart contract? The idea of smart contracts has actually been around for a while. Um, in the 90s, a guy called Nick Zabo in 1994 said, we could use smart contracts to basically satisfy 
contractual agreements. Um, basically, we're minimising the exceptions of malicious and accidental flaws within the contracts. Um, and we're basically minimising the need for trust intermediaries. I know we do have mm, a lawyer in the room, or a couple of lawyers. I don't personally think it will replace lawyers. I just had to put that quote in there. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's essentially what you're doing is instead of transferring Bitcoin in, in that kind of line transaction code, you're putting in an actual code that executes under some kind of, um, well, you can, it triggers like an event when something happens. So this maybe could be like completing on a house. Um, and So Ethereum, I had to put Ethereum in here because it is one of the biggest platforms of smart contracts and kind of like, it, you know, um, it can really do anything you want it to. So if we remember our application server before, we have an application on server, we have some um, clients, Within our Bitcoin network, we now have to have an application server, an application layer basically running on all of these nodes. And this can be done on Ethereum, and it's called a DAP. So I had to look at what that meant. What is a DAP? I'm saying it. Um, so what are Ethereum accounts? So they actually have four different types of things. They have a nonce. Um, you have a balance of what they call Ether, which is their version of Bitcoin. Um, you have a contract code and you have storage as well on this network. So there are two types of accounts, one which stores your ether and one which actually has the contract in it. And they have something called gas, um, not that kind of gas, although I thought it would be good representation. Gas is what they basically call a charge, which is you're basically charged to run your code. From every single line that's executed, they charge you a very, very small gas fee. It basically stops the... Um, DDoS attacks because if you imagine you can just spam a network completely with like loads of random code all the time but it'll cost you a lot of money so people tend not to do that um, and it is used. Um, I do have to mention EOS to be fair um, because EOS it's a decentralized operating system. Ethereum has a lot of issues with it and um, well not so much but EOS is another really what I put a link in here because I'm not going to cover it but if you want to have a look I would really recommend having a look so it is a decentralized operating system so it's said to support industrial scale decentralized applications so I just wanted to I think this is more of the talk this and the next bit of the talk I kind of want us to have more of a two-way discussion on this um, from what we've seen so far of what blockchain is. This is how it is being used. So, I mean, it's literally everywhere. The hype is real. It's like Spotify acquires it for this. You can now upload your health records to the blockchain. Uh, you can track diamonds through it. It's been, it's, it is actually, I think, the most, the most successful um, application of blockchain so far is in the supply chain because you're dealing with a lot of people, a lot of different steps in supply chain. You might not be able to you're not going to have the same system that you're working on. So that's how the IBM is really pioneering supply chain blockchain. Um, Accenture's on the insurance angle, and then you've even got bit property. Um, I wanted to put this bit in it, e-Estonia. So Estonia have developed this portal, and you can literally upload your, you can view your medical records in it, you can view what how, like a house that you own, you have like your schooling records in, like everything is, is in this portal. And it's been, it's been reported that um, you know, Estonia is pioneering ahead with blockchain adoption. They've even put it in this portal that everyone logs into. Well, not entirely true. Estonia actually were using what people are calling blockchain before the Bitcoin paper was found. So you're probably asking how and why is that possible? That's because Estonia, they're not using blockchain as we just learned that Bitcoin is. They're actually using hashed based time stamping. So you literally take a bit of data, you time stamp it with a hash, you basically say this hash is valid, and they take another bit of data and you do that. And what they're trying to say is, look, we're managing the system of decentralized databases and we're hashing all of our data and your data and then you're the person that can access it. So to them, it was a trust thing for their citizens. They wanted to be like, look guys, here's all of your data, you can manage it, you can own it, we're hashing it so that you know that we've not changed it, we're not distributing it. Um, so that was a trust thing, but it's really interesting that it's been now coined their pioneering blockchain, but they were utilizing this before what we know as blockchain has come out. <clears throat> Who developed this? So it's more like cryptographic 
hashes and digital signatures and stuff have been. The in. blockchain. Who actually owned it in the first place? Would you know that? So it, the, it was the 2008 paper from Satoshi Nakamoto that. Um, he, I think he used a lot of sources of lots of different papers because there was lots of different papers from peer-to-peer -peer currencies that, that he kind of like, he or she or the group, kind of put it into <coughs> a workable system. And what makes blockchain stand out is that loads of different servers can come to a consensus. So it's not managed by a third party. In the Estonia case, they're managing all the servers. So they don't need consensus. They can just cash. Okay. Um, <coughs> For blockchain, there was a group for the site CryptoPunks, which took the paper and then started developing technology. Yeah. They're, they're mostly all in jail now um, due to regulation. Do they live in Prague? They have like a yeah, it's a, weird, it's a weird old group. But yeah. yeah. You can only pay in Bitcoin. At yeah. Bank, banking on Bitcoin is a documentary that explains the, the origin of it in a fair, fair bit of detail. Yeah. Actually, um, it's really good that you mentioned the, the cypherpunks because they they are kind of like the core crypto anarchists. If you imagine about crypto, and it's not just blockchain, it's encryption. I don't know whether you guys were following the news, again, when Amber Rudd said about key escrow, this was like last year or something, and everyone cringed because no, you can't have key escrow, but it's talking about encryption. What is the right of us to encrypt our data where other people cannot read it? So if you imagine with our iPhone, we've encrypted our iPhone, governments cannot get into that iPhone because it's just encryption that they don't have the keys for. So there's this whole societal debate going on at the moment, which is, um, you know, do you value your privacy more than you value security or nation, your national security, and stuff like that. So it's this, we'll go into this in a sec. So, but yeah, and it's the hype of blockchain, it's the hype of encryption that has happened. So bold statements, how blockchain, this is my screenshot, I just typed in how blockchain will change your organizations, affect banks, change your life. Will it change your life? But no. Uh, change banking, uh, change your point, disrupt business, change healthcare. So people are just thinking that this is just a massive hype. Stephen Brett, I don't know who Stephen Brett is, he, he has said, it's time for your business to start embracing blockchain. It's the biggest game changer in technology since the internet. <coughs> I have to say, I'm, an, I'm skeptical. With everything that we have gone through today, this is really what I wanted us to be discussing. But everyone from different industries to, to look, are we... Are we Feeling that the hype is real, we're thinking that it is a disruptive technology. Oh my God, we can do these ledgers that are immutable, and like you know, we can distribute our systems, um, or, or are we not? So, I think I don't know whether we can agree or not, but I think that there is some use and quite positive use for the public blockchain. I think the cryptocurrencies, um, lots of people. You know, it is a compromise between privacy and decentralization and national security, of course. Just like the cypherpunks, they really, really don't want to be under any kind of government. Um, so, what does it give us? Well, it gives us some level of, of pseudonymity and anonymity if you want. Again, if you're posting your public key everywhere, then that's definitely not anonymous, it's 100% linked to you. Um, and again, it's just this idea of multiple untrusted parties arriving at consensus, which is, is quite unique. Um, you know, to be able to do that. But of course, that there are really negative sides to it as well. Everyone's heard of the dark web, it's being, and Bitcoin is what is used in the majority of um, cyber attacks, especially ransomware, and just in general money laundering and everything like that, it's just rife. Um, Could be used for terrorism. Yeah. Uh, terrorist groups sending plans and projects to each other. Yeah, the blockchain probably wouldn't because it's immutable, so we'd be able to see all of the that stuff. Yeah. Um, encryption is. Yeah. Encryption is massively. They, they, um, it's widely known that terrorists might use WhatsApp or something because it's, it provides you with that end-to-end -end encryption. Right. Um, which but is the why point, there is... The point, yeah. the point is, I think, that mm -hmm. I can choose to encrypt some stuff mm -hmm. to send to you and mm -hmm. we, we've exchanged keys. Mm -hmm. And that's... <coughs> That, that is stuff that That's we, we share. Mm -hmm. you know. But if I want to just whack out an email, mm -hmm. open, then that's, you know, mm -hmm. so I can, I can the point yeah. is I've got the choice of whether I encrypt some stuff yeah. that I don't want anybody else to, not, to see or know about, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, or, or it's, 
or it's open. Exactly, and it, it's also it's the point of do you want your freedom to be impacted just because you know yeah. bad people are using the systems? Will they not just find their own things to use anyway? So that that's the encryption debate really at its heart. Exactly, you know. Exactly. Yeah. So so. You, so do, do I put it in the double envelope? Yeah, I know. <laughs> to be honest, it's probably safer sending a letter in the post than it is nowadays. Exactly. I'm speaking of the answer. <coughs> um, yeah, and and just just an, a thing about this though, you know, um, just because we've got cryptography and just because we've got these systems that are you know in themselves very unique, it doesn't mean that the surrounding infrastructure is secure. Um, so you know, I, I just feel like, and I haven't done this. Hopefully, what I'll be basing my thesis on at university, just just digging into this hype. Like, but basically, the security around clients. So this this happened because somebody put a Ethereum, or quite a lot of people put Ethereum clients on their computers that had no firewall, no password, um, no anything, and someone just, just literally they got. <laughs> someone literally just. And they had an open port, a random open port, and someone just hopped for, on the Ethereum network onto their computer just with their wallet ID and their IP address and just transferred everything out. Um, you know, and this is obviously personal security, but everyone's talking about how you need to be a little bit more secure personally and we need to put passwords on our things, but there's not the awareness for cryptocurrencies how you're secure on them. So, you know, I'm, I'm scared about the hype encouraging people to, to invest and they don't have the security around it. Um, of course, you, as usual, governance and uh, the law, in any particular jurisdiction, is always a loop and a hop behind yeah. technology advance. Yeah. So they're always going to be behind. So I think that members of the public, before they jump into Bitcoin, Right, ooh, ha, ha. Mm. They better wait for the law to catch up. Yeah, I know. Well, up. in in the US, it's now taxable income. You have to declare it. Um, this is after they shut down Set Road, they they sold quite a lot of it for themselves. So I think they got a good deal out of it. But but you're absolutely right. It's um, it's just one step. Behind before, the way, yeah. Nice yeah. step ahead if you look at it from that way. Yeah, yeah, um, and I put I've just put the DAO here. I'm not going to go into it in, in much detail. If you want a little bit more information, but this was a decentralised autonomous organisation, and again, these ICO crowd crowdfunding projects, the unbelievable amount of money that is going into these is insane. 11.5 million ether. So they put this on the. So what they did was they developed an app. They put it on Ethereum. And again, when you put code on Ethereum, you cannot change it because it's unchangeable. And then they realised there was a bug in it. So what do you do when you're, you're patching code? You can't patch code in the same way. They had to basically, and because they so many people were interacting with the DAO, uh, Ethereum had to hard fork out of this mess. And that actually the creator of Ethereum had to be like, okay, because the, the, the actual value of Ethereum was going down because so many people were using the DAO and the DAO was faulty. That, so I mean, this just insane. Like, to put an application on blockchain and then realize you need to patch it, and then you have loads of that just, yeah, I think that there are different. There are different. Um, I put in the EOS because EOS, I think, is that step of public blockchain you need to actually do applications on. Um, and Bitcoin, um, Ethereum has its has its things as well. But okay, so private blockchain. So I think this, I feel, is where the hype has been most put on. Oh, you can integrate it into your organisation. And I put a little quote that I just made up because that was funny. Um, here's a problem, let's use blockchain. Why? Uh, because blockchain is really relevant right now and we should implement it and it's really cool. Um, why is the question. Um, you are an internal organisation you trust, hopefully, trust your internal organisation and you trust your third party. So do you need to deploy blockchain? That is the question. Um, Ramesh from the VP of Blockchain Solutions at IBM is uh, really, he's talking here about uh, supply chain blockchain. So when you have to rely on data in four or five or hops upstream, you have a reason to trust it and blockchain provides that. So they're providing solutions for organizations to secure their supply chain. And Walmart was a, has just recently, like last month, taken up IBM's um, solution as well. Um, yeah, so just go on. This is the last slide. Um, just to call to the experts really in the room, everyone has their own industry, <laughs> some experts, um, everyone has their own industry and um, I think with anything that is hyped up, you've got to really understand what is actually going on, is it really relevant to your business? So, 
So firstly, let me ask a question. Do you have a problem with your business? Can you identify a problem with your industry or with your organisation? Okay. If that's a yes, carry on with me. So is that problem to do with maintaining a database or an application? If it is yes, then stay with me. So is there a lack of trust internally with either members of different departments who are running this database or with your clients or suppliers? Take yes. And the last one is, are you not able or wanting to outsource this to a trusted third party? And if the answer is that you're, you don't want to do that, then yes, the blockchain, in these instances, I think the blockchain might be good and useful to investigate, but it would still be probably on a case-by-case -case basis, and probably with someone like IBM if you were that massive. Um, but yeah, so that's basically it. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, hello. Hi, yeah. Do you think it could ever become mainstream? The fact that a user could lose their private key and that's all their money gone. Mm -hmm. Can that ever, I mean, you surely you've got to have a fail stage. If you lose your banking pin, mm -hmm. they send you a new pin and you get your money back. Mm -hmm. So can it ever become a mainstream product if you can lose your, all your money like that? I think it can if, you, if a third party is running it. Mm -hmm. Because you know, which basically mm -hmm. just takes the whole point out of it. It needs to be a bonded company. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it needs to be. So they're, they're, they're trusted. But yeah. doesn't that defeat the point that it's someone trying to Well, exactly, that it does, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the decentralization aspect of it, you know, who are you going, are you going to decentralize services to look at fraud and to, to give you a fail -serve or to pay membership fees to, and it's not, that because each node is working independently, they are actually working in competition with each other because they want to mine the next block, they want to get the next thing. So what you're talking about there is is people actually working together to make sure the system's safe, and in which case they would kind of be a third party that's working together. In, in my opinion, but it's probably... <coughs> well, I, I think that perhaps a company would be set up, maybe it would be overseen by the, a government, a jurisdiction, a legal jurisdiction, and insurance might come into it where the company had an indemnity insurance to, to uh, bond it, so sign a bond to guarantee the uh, security of all its users, mm -hmm. even if they're competitors. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, build a Chinese wall in effect. Mm -hmm. Banks use Chinese walls. I don't know how effective they are, but there you are. You know, it's just, let's talk about it and throw it in the air. Yeah, know? absolutely. Yeah. No, it, it's definitely possible. I think you've got to think, but still, what would be the reasoning of it if it had to be uh, managed within one country when they've got, you've got your own circulatory, you've got your own currency, fiat currency, right. which is managed. But another thing about Bitcoin, actually, I will say, is that you've seen it spike, haven't you? People have been saying, I've been investing in Bitcoin. I have to say, I find it funny a little bit because it's not really investing if it's so volatile. Um, and the spike happened because there's only a set amount of bitcoins that are going to be released and there's then you're not able to but the demand went up and so suddenly the, the price went up whereas if you're looking at fiat currency it kind of they try and balance that with distributing more more fiat currency so when you don't have that's bitcoin's not built for scale basically but you can pull <laughs> <laughs> um, but yes I suppose, I suppose the there's a big difference between Bitcoin and blockchain. Yes, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, like, yeah. I think yeah. the applications of blockchain in industry are huge. Um, the applications of Bitcoin in industry limited to none. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. just because you're interested in Bitcoin or blockchain or either way mm -hmm. doesn't mean that the other one like, isn't the option. Mm -hmm. So I think in industry, blockchain technology is huge amounts of opportunity of Bitcoin. Yeah. I question whether it is true blockchain technology as we think of it though. Because thinking about Estonia and thinking about how they're using hash-based time stamping because they're managing all the databases. So if you're using it internally to a company, you don't need to mine in the same way. Um, but you do want integrity of your data and you do maybe want immutability. So, you know, I, I think that blockchain, you're right, is almost migrated from what it is with public you know, cryptocurrencies into more of a you know or not, or an organizational setting but you still have to really consider is it going to be worth it for your organization and I actually I went to a conference recently and spoke to some some finance people and I just really wanted to get their opinion on it 
oh, tell me, what do you think of blockchain? And, you know, the reaction was surprising, but they said, oh, it's clunky, absolutely not, you know, not worth it. It's what cost benefits, you know? Yeah, they were just like, you know, they, they said, you know, the systems we've got set up at the moment, we have trust relationships with people that we need. With the system that we have works, it's incredibly slick, and they just viewed blockchain as being very clunky. Yeah. Whereas, you know, other people there, you know, from maybe more of the tech side of things, were like, oh, it's great, it's just this new, innovative, it, it's maybe the best thing about it is it's just making you think a little bit more about trust, about relying on your data to a third party, maybe it's making us think that we maybe don't want to be doing that and want more control. And, yeah. So I, um, I think um, one of the main points is people keep on saying about blockchain. Blockchain is something different from the digital currency. Mm. Blockchain facilitates the digital currency. Nakamoto. Uh, in, uh, his intention was to, to run, create a digital currency. That's why he created the blockchain, or mm -hmm. people say he created blockchain. Mm -hmm. but as, as you mentioned uh, a few times, uh, I think was that the blockchain itself, uh, in, in my opinion, and lots of people in the industry, if you want to maintain data integrity, you want to maintain accountability. Blockchain is the only way. Mm -hmm. uh, the notion of trust in the old world in the industry is being able to trust. Mm -hmm. It doesn't provide data integrity. Okay, you mentioned about giving to the third party company. How can you trust AWS or Google or Microsoft? Mm -hmm. when they, they have their, their own problems in terms of keeping our data. Uh, intact. So um, blockchain and digital currency is completely different things. Mm -hmm. It's just digital and it's not only between us being you know, but there are lots of other digital currencies uh, in, in here. Uh, digital currency, there are lots of security concerns as you mentioned about digital currency, like 51% 50, of people are mining and they get 51% and then they hide. The part of the pool which they don't want to be shown to, to other miners. But about blockchain itself, I think it's a revolution. If you um, want to keep data intact and assert the accountability of the organization, I think blockchain is, is, is a, it's a fascinating thing. Mm -hmm. And it will create, a, um, it, it will be one of the big things in the tech industry. I mean, already they started. A lot of things happening. <coughs> they, they're not um, Google, Microsoft. They're not publishing what they do in terms of blockchain. The blockchain will be, uh, or IBM, one you mentioned. Mm -hmm. If you want to stop uh, attacks like Monaco or Ethereum, mm -hmm. you need blockchain. Mm -hmm. uh, other things won't work all the time. You can keep patching mm -hmm. this network. You may not be in a regular place and you may uh, miss some stuff in blockchain. You're not missing anything. But a good example is of the version control of documents. We used to send a word document to someone and ask them to review and send us a different version. But now, in the document, two people at the same time, different parts of the planet, they work in the same document. So blockchain prevents um, uh, issues which we have as an example of that blockchain. So it's not only about digital currency, it's not only about cryptocurrency, it's one of the use of blockchain is digital currency. Mm -hmm. I think they're calling it distributed ledger technologies, yeah. like blockchain is a distributed ledger technologies, but these are being developed by the companies, so exactly what you're saying. But we never, mm -hmm. never, you know, if you look at the last hundred years, we, we have encryption in a different way, they have one path it could be in blockchain. They have a lot of different parts of encryption. Blockchain is the only one It's actually using um, uh, encryption in a way you can work in, in, in people who don't have technical um, uh, ability to escape, they can use it without having that, that te technical, um, mm -hmm. technical skills which mm -hmm. they need for the control and encryption. Yeah, I certainly think it has, it definitely has uses, and um, I think it's on a case-by-case -case basis where the organisation needs it. 
but you know working you know across the world you could and they have distributed servers all over the world that, that offer you that same functionality if they're all controlled by the same person or all controlled by the same entity so I think really what I'm really interested in kind of like looking at a little bit more is um, well really it was the security concerns around having a full database distributed around lots and lots of nodes uh, in a network that maybe aren't so secure what kind of implement I just don't think there has been enough um, research into implementing these types of systems because let's be honest like nobody is properly using the blockchain system at the moment it's still kind of in its infancy in organizations so I think um, it was someone from IBM that said it's like five to 25 what well, between five and 25 years before it's even going to be adopted in the like, supply chain so I'm going to draw this discussion to a close <laughs> I'm going to thank Zoe incredibly for, for that it was really really <laughs> And, you know, uh, uh, obviously these, these things we're doing on a regular, regular basis. The main man at the back there. Um, no, it's, it's in all seriousness, the one argument I would have is that I've been doing this for 40 years. And it's, we're all still doing the same thing. We're still doing integrity. We're still doing security. We're still doing... Nothing's changed. It's all the same stuff. But we've got a new name for it. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for, for coming and doing it. Uh, it, was, it, was a, it, it, was a, it was a lovely discussion. I'm, I'm glad you all enjoyed it as much as I did. So, um, and I believe there is a little um, glassette outside. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> quick question. Will sure. uh, the slides be moved over? Yeah, sure. Of course. No, yes, sir. Yeah, uh, and Andy takes <coughs> care of all that, and he will make not only the, the video and, and, and the slides, he's, he's, he is the man. <laughs> See the marketing section. So? Marketing section. No, he just, he just <laughs> he ju he's just the one that makes everything happen. <laughs> Man Friday, yeah. Man Friday. Anyway, thank you so much. That was